I would like to introduce someone who has inspired me. First things first, though, but welcome back for those of you that made it in this morning. That's great. We appreciate that, and you're going to be blessed today. You really are. I want to bring Tanner Guzzi up on stage. He's a father of three, a fourth on the way in December. Give him a hand with that. <laughs> he doesn't know that I was going to say that. <laughs> Creator of masculine style, someone to listen to, to talk. He's going to talk to you about upping your game, and he's got something special for you this morning. Tanner Guzzi. Thanks, George. Appreciate it. Good morning, guys. Good morning. How are you doing? I am excited to talk to you today. Um, I've been thinking about this related to what I wanted to go over, and yes, I had prepared a bunch of slides and a whole presentation about style. However, I recently learned this new word. It's hypergamy, hypergamy. I think I want to talk about, no, I'm just kidding. I'm not going to talk about that today. <laughs> I was a little worried you guys were too hungover and that was going to land very well, so we can get started. Um, before I dive in, though, I do want to tell you guys, this is my third year, and the quality of the way that you guys are dressing is, you guys are killing it. You're doing really well, and I'm really impressed because, yes, there's, there's room for improvement. There always is, but I can tell that you guys have put some thought into it that you're actually thinking about how it is that you're trying to present yourselves, that you're trying to communicate something with your image, that you're trying to tell a story, that you have some self-respect, that it's not just, well, you know, my office did a 5K with the local bank and I got this t-shirt, so that's what I'm gonna throw on today with the cargo shorts I've had for 20 years. But you guys are actually dressing in a way that's communicating some self-respect, some dignity, and some authority, and so I'm, I appreciate that. And I hope that you guys recognize that in yourselves because that's a powerful thing, whether or not it should be, is irrelevant because it is. And so I, I, I appreciate that and so I wanna say thank you guys. Um, what I wanna talk about with you guys today is I guess it's kind of the red pill related to appearance. You know, we, we understand that the world tells us pretty lies to make us feel good about ourselves and reality is not pretty. And one of the reasons why we're here is because we've gone through this transition of being naive to being woken up to the reality of what's actually happening around us Sometimes that leads to cynicism. Hopefully you guys can get through that and get out of your cynicism phase into a phase of courage where you're ready to actually do something with that. And obviously I believe that that's the case. That's why you're here. None of us are here because we wanna be stuck in a cynicism phase. And there's pretty lies about our relationship with the way that we look that we're told as men. And so what I wanna go over with you today is what those are, why they're absolutely garbage, and how you can actually work your way past them so that you can leverage your appearance to help you become better versions of yourself, so that you can become more successful in your relationships with other people, but also so that you can have a better self-perception of who you are and what you deserve out of life, and so that you can see yourself as actually living up to the full potential of what you have. I know that that can sound kind of woo-woo, and how are my clothes really gonna do that, but there are deep psychological things that go on with the clothing that we put onto our bodies, both in how other people interpret that and what we see when we, put, when we catch ourselves in the mirror, whether you know you're, walking past a building like this and you catch a glimpse of yourself in the, in the windows or you're getting ready in the morning, the man that you see staring back at you can either look like somebody who's ready to uh, make his dent in the universe, I like how Richard Cooper was putting that yesterday, or he can look like a guy who's just trying to be safe and trying to fly under the radar. It's up to you, and what's nice is that you've got control over that, it's not up to anybody else. So, let's dive into these. All right, the first one, man, this is universal. You shouldn't judge a book by its cover. That is stupid. It really is, because if you think about the reality of how we interact with other people and all the data that comes into our brains, there's no possible way that we could look at, I mean, think about looking at every single other man in this room and treating each other like they're complete blank slates. We have no idea. I'm not gonna make any assessments about you. I'm not gonna prejudge whether you're a friend or a foe, whether you're a threat, whether you're somebody who shares like interests. I'm just gonna treat you like a blank slate. From a biological perspective, our brains would just break from trying to be able to handle that. We create shortcuts in order to be able to properly classify things and in order to be able to actually put things into boxes so that we can better understand and better navigate the world. Stereotypes, especially stereotypes about the way that we look exist for a reason. That's uncomfortable. It sucks to hear that. 
But it's absolutely true. Those stereotypes exist for a reason, and so we can complain about it, or we can actually use it to our advantage. Now, I, I struggled with this one a lot when I was, when I was a kid, especially when I was a teenager. Um, I'm from Salt Lake City, Utah. I'm a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. I'm a Mormon. And uh, when I was in junior high and high school, I was really into BMX and punk rock. So very much not like in line with church culture and things like that, right? Very opposite. And I remember having like my safety pins in my backpack, you know, and all of my, uh, I tried to dye my hair black and I grew these awful sideburns that you can only grow when you're 16 and they're super ugly because it's all scraggly and bad. And wearing, you know, my, uh, my BMX t-shirts and my bike chain wallet, and it's just awful. And I remember arguing with my parents and arguing with people at school. It's like, you can't judge me. You don't know if I'm a good person or not. You're just a bunch of selfish pricks. You don't have any idea. And of course, that's what we want to convince ourselves because we think that anybody else who judges us based on the way that we look, they're the jerks, right? That somehow we're more righteous or more holy or more whatever than they are, and they're just a bunch of, they're just a bunch of jerks for judging us based on the way that we look. But the reality is, is if you kind of look like a punk rocker, Regardless of whether or not you act like one, people should assume that that's what you are. And you kind of want to be associated with that, right? Otherwise, you wouldn't look that way. And it's the same thing with any of these other associations. Now, the reason why we're told this lie is because it's trying to shift the onus of responsibility off of us. If you think about it this way, if you guys aren't allowed to judge me based on the way that I dress, then all of a sudden that means I'm not responsible for the way that I look. You guys are. How comfortable is that if I don't have to be responsible for that, if the rest of you guys are? It's no wonder that's such an appealing lie that we're told every day. But the reality is, is we absolutely are responsible for the way that we look. We're absolutely responsible for the way that we interpret that. And I will tell you that it goes in the other direction. The right way to handle this, because yes, there are exceptions to the rule. I dress like a punk rocker, but man, was I a bad rebel. I never drank, I never smoked, I never did. I was a terrible rebel. All I did was listen to whiny music and tell my parents, you're not my dad. Okay, I didn't actually say that to my dad, but it was about the equivalent of that. I was a bad rebel, so I really didn't actually fit that, that mold, that tribe, even though I tried to to the extent that I could. And so you could say that I was the exception to the rule. And so what, yes, there are exceptions. And so what our responsibility is, is the people who are perceiving the way that other people dress is absolutely judge a book by its cover. And then be open to reassessing that judgment based on further information that you get, right? You don't have to just put somebody into a box and say, well, based on the way you look, that's who you are, and anything else that I'm, you're going to try and tell me is different is a lie, because then we're just handicapping ourselves. And so the burden of responsibility is always on you, whether you're the person who's being judged for the way that you look or you're the person who is doing the judging based on the way that somebody else looks, the burden of responsibility is always on you. And that's just life in general, right? Burden of responsibility is always on us. It's not on anybody else. All right, let's go to the next one. I love this one. Real men don't care how they look. How many of you guys have ever heard that before? Yeah. So there's so many things that tie into this. And this is one of the, the biggest and dumbest myths in the world. This is one of the things, I love talking about this one on Twitter, which at Tanner Guzzi, you guys can follow me there. Um, men historically, in every culture, at any point in history, have always used our appearance, and particularly our clothing, to express our masculinity, and use it as ways to gauge things like courage, strength, mastery, and honor, stuff like Jack Donovan talks about as the tactical virtues. Use it to signal things like status, or fitness, or accomplishments, or anything else. I want you to look at these kinds of photos and tell me that these men wearing these things don't care how they look. It's a preposterous idea. Men always have and always will care about the way that they look. Now, this lie is rooted in a couple of different things. And the biggest one is kind of this uniquely American idea that real men don't care what anybody else thinks of them, right? We hear that one a lot, too. You know, if you're a real man, you just do your own thing, and it doesn't matter what anybody else thinks, which really, you're just describing a sociopath, if you say that. If you really don't care what anybody else thinks about you at all, you have a problem. And so we see this, but then the problem is, is the world tells us that we have to go, it, we're given a false dichotomy. It's either I'm a sociopath and I don't care what anybody thinks, or welcome to a global society where everybody's opinion has to matter to me. It's a false dichotomy. None of, the, none of those is the right answer. 
What matters is that the opinion of the right people matters to you. You look at these kind of men, and I guarantee you that this guy doesn't care what that guy thinks of him. They're not the same tribe. They're not the same part of the world. They don't have shared goals. They don't have shared beliefs. They don't care. But these guys care what each other thinks. These guys care what each other thinks, right? There is nothing wrong and everything right with caring what other men think of you. But they have to earn the right for their opinion to matter to you. And when they do, then you have to maintain that loyalty and maintain that honor within them. And one of the ways to do that is by caring about the way that you look, right? This is absolutely one of those things that, you, and you'll hear it over and over and over again. Real men don't care. Real men absolutely care. Honor is one of those things that matters. And for you men who are trying to do something more, my family, my wife, my kids, their opinion matters to me. They've earned that right. A lot of the speakers here, guys that I've known for years, their opinions matter to me. I've got clients here, their opinions matter to me. You guys, way more so than somebody else who's just staying in the hotel, your opinions have started to matter to me. That's a good thing. Embrace that and recognize that if somebody is basing their opinion on you based on the way that you look, that you either need to determine, one, if they already do matter and if their opinions matter, or two, if their opinions have the potential for mattering. If you're going in for a job interview or you run your own business and you're looking to talk to a potential client, you better believe their opinion matters to you, right? Otherwise, you're not getting the job or you're not getting the sale. Some idiot on the street or some YouTube, I can already tell you, I can already see the, the YouTube comments because it's happened every year that I've been here. This dude's gonna talk about style? Look at that stupid suit. Why would anybody wear something like that? Every time, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what I wear. It really doesn't matter. And that's another thing you guys need to embrace because one of the other reasons why we tell ourselves that real men don't care how they look is because we're just trying to play it safe. We're just trying to make it so that we're not polarizing and we're really just trying to play not to lose, as opposed to trying to play to win. And I'll tell you guys, the only way to not be judged based on your appearance is to not be noticed. Right, it really is. That's the only way to not be judged is to just not be noticed. And sadly, that's what the majority of men do when it comes to their clothing. They just think, well, I'm not gonna, I'm just gonna put on whatever is comfortable. Because you know what? If somebody really didn't care about how he looked, he'd be raiding his wife's closet. He'd be happy to wear her clothes. It wouldn't matter, right? Dress, tights, whatever, I don't care. I'll put on whatever I want. Exactly, we, we can hear how comical that is, but it's a pretty lie that he tells himself because he knows that he's trying to avoid this and so all he's doing is playing not to lose. All, I only care to the extent that I don't look like an idiot because then if I have to actually, whoa, if I actually have to take a social risk and people might think that I look stupid for what I'm, I, I can't handle that. What if my friends make fun of me? What if the people at work actually make a comment? What, what if I screw up and I wear something that's wrong? And it's, it's kind of silly to think that we're scared of that, but a lot of men really are. It's not a physical risk, but there's a social risk that comes with that. That's why we call guys who do start to change their style, oh, he's trying too hard. Oh, what a poser. What happened to you, Ted? You changed. Whatever. Those are the kind of guys who are just going to continue in every regard in their lives to play not to lose, as opposed to playing to win. And so, yes, you can care about how you look. You should care about how you look. Your life will get better as you care about how you look, and you gauge that properly, both within your own self-perception and the way that people who matter to you or have the potential to matter to you will react to the way that you look. Everybody else? They don't matter. You don't have to worry about it with them. All right, let's talk about line number three. I hear this one a lot, especially in the uh, rare time that I you know, get a backtrack and I'm being talked about on some pickup forum and it's usually a bunch of you know, chubby Timmies that are out there trying to do their day, their day game and well, you know, all I, all I have to do is have a good approach game. It doesn't matter how I look and confidence is all that matters, right? This guy is pretty confident. Look at this, he's got on Cut off with this weird purple tie. He's dyed his hair green and purple. Confidence isn't gonna save that. This dude looks like an idiot. Sorry. Doesn't matter how confident he is. You go out, that is not a winning combination. It does not matter how confident you are. Confidence is absolutely a component of dressing well. 
But to think that that supersedes everything is ridiculous. It's like saying, I don't need to have brakes because my car will go 200 miles an hour. It's like, yeah, you're going to win the race, but there's going to be consequences that come with that, right? There's, there's more to the car than just how fast it goes. And yes, there's more to dressing well than just having confidence. There's actually three things, and I want to go through those pretty quickly with you because it's related to this. You have to have context, confidence, and then competence as well. When you get those three things dialed in, that's when you can actually develop a really good sense of style. And when I talk about context, what I mean is, okay, take what I'm wearing today. If I were to go down to Miami and go try and go surfing on the beach, I would be an idiot, right? Because the context is inappropriate. If I even, even from a perspective of, again, I'm out of Salt Lake City, it was snowing when I left my house on Wednesday. If I were to be wearing what I had on there here today, Oh, that would be physically uncomfortable, and it's totally inappropriate for the context of everything else that we have going on. If I had a tuxedo on, it would be inappropriate as far as the context. If I were just up here in my swim trunks and a pair of flip-flops, it would be inappropriate as far as the context is concerned. And that's where you need to be able to navigate the social expectations of where you are and what it is that you're actually trying to accomplish. That context is, is important. We'll talk a little bit more about that as we get further into one of the other myths. Competence is a big one, too. Dressing well is actually a skill set. And it's kind of hard to hear that because you want to be able to think, okay, well, I care and I'm going to try, so therefore I'm going to win. And yes, you can do that, but you can also suck at it even if you try. And there really is a skill set that's involved with it. And the ability to understand all the little nuance that goes into it and how to create something that's, that's visually interesting and it's congruent with who you are and it's telling the correct story and it's something that people want to see and that they're receptive to seeing. All of that stuff requires some skill. So you have to have the competence to be able to do that. And then yes, confidence does matter. I'll tell you that the, the people who do what I do, but they're more in kind of like the stylist as opposed to the coaching component where you know you would basically pay somebody a few grand to you know, it's usually some 22-year-old chick with a fashion degree named Gina, and she's going to go out and, you know, buy some clothes for you. And you're going to put that on. And yes, that may be great from both a context and a competence perspective because she's been able to take care of those two things for you. But if you don't feel awesome in it, your body language is all kind of shrunken, or you feel like you're a poser, or you just feel like, oh, this isn't me at all, then it doesn't matter how good you look. The confidence does matter. But again, confidence is not the only thing that matters. It doesn't supersede everything. You have to have all three of these in order to be able to actually dress well. Okay, so let's talk a little bit more about uh, that idea of context because this is one of the biggest ones that I see is guys now finally start to make the jump over into, yeah, I'm gonna care about the way that I look. A lot of times guys see this as kind of a, a light switch where good style is formal, it's a suit, right? How many of you guys have ever thought that before? Okay, well, I would like to dress better, but I don't wanna, I don't wanna wear a suit all the time, right? I, I deal with that a lot. I have a lot of guys who, they talk to me about um, going through one of my programs or anything, they say, yeah, I'm interested, I just don't wanna wear a suit all the time. Good, I don't wear a suit all the time, not at all. I, I like wearing suits, I worked for a custom suit company for years, I, I love it. But I don't wear a suit all the time because it's not the only way to have style. Just like when you hear all these other people who talk about the idea that bad style, well, America's gotten too casual. We're, our style sucks and we don't look like men anymore because we're just too casual. I was like, well, I would agree that our style sucks now compared to the way that it used to be, but correlation and causation are not the same thing. And our style doesn't suck because it's too casual. It sucks because of the execution and because we're playing to not lose instead of playing to win. So no, you do not have to dress up in order to dress well. That's one of the reasons why as Anthony asked me to help create the, uh, the dress code and the expectation for you guys as you were getting ready to come out to this event that we spoke very specifically about not saying that there is a specific dress code in regards to formality. Formality is not the only thing that matters. And some of you guys are killing it in a t-shirt and jeans and other guys are doing really great in suits. Some of you guys don't look great in suits and other you guys don't look great in t-shirt and jeans. The formality is irrelevant. That is one of many things. Again, we think about it when we're getting started as this light switch. But what it really is, I'm just going to skip those, what it really is is a soundboard, okay? This is one of the things I teach my clients, is that good style, it's a whole soundboard, and you have all these little dials that you can play with. Yes, formality is one of them, but you have other things like color or pattern or texture 
or fit, or are you trying to stand out or fit in, or so many other things that you can tweak with. And in order to really have good style, you need to understand what the expectation, the context is, and then be able to know how to tweak every single one of those dials in order to be able to get it right. Saying that good style is formal and bad style is casual is kind of like saying good music is classical and bad music is everything else. Yeah, I, I love classical music, but I also still love punk rock and I like hip hop. And I know this is kind of weird, but I'm actually starting to like even a little bit of country, which is, I don't know what that is. But <laughs> thank you, I guess. <laughs> right? But it's not, again, it's not this, this false binary, this false dichotomy of formal is good, casual is bad. It, it doesn't work like that. There, there are a lot of ways to be able to do that. And so I'll go back to these. I'll show you this example. This is the way that most of the world thinks. Bad style because it's casual. Good style because it's formal. This is great, not just because it's formal. And this is bad, not just because it's casual. Because here's the opposite. Super casual, but the fit's good. Right? The context is really good. He's a good looking guy. He's got some things that are visually interesting that are going on. The colors work well. There's interesting textures. This is just awful. Right? <laughs> the fit is bad. The shoes are terrible. I don't know what that vest is or why. I mean, he looks like he's 40 going to prom, which is creepy in and of itself. You know? Yeah, it's formal, but this is not good style. So again, you got to get out of that mindset that formal equals good and casual equals bad. Because it's not, it's not that simple. You need to be able to play with the whole soundboard. OK, so related to that, and again, this is where you get some of these guys who decide, you know, I'm, I'm going to be into style. We kind of look at the old times. We look at especially kind of the classic age. And you, know, you could even say that these guys are the equivalent of the trad cons when it comes to style stuff. Because you look at guys like, uh, like uh, Cary Grant. And you'll go, yes, this is, this is when men dress like men. This is what good style was, or Steve McQueen, or this kind of stuff. And that, that, that's true. But then you get guys who try and dress that way today. They're gentle dorks, right? I, I'm not going to, this, this is a kid. He's a senior in high school. These are his senior high school pictures with the top hat and the vest and everything else. And you know he's got the, the collar pin and all that. And he thinks. I'm bringing, you know, I'm bringing some class back. The ladies, I'm going to kill it, you know, when really it's like, why are, they, why are they with all the football players instead of with, you're a gentle dork, dude. You think you're being a gentleman. You think that you're dressing well, and you're cosplaying. This is a costume. <laughs> it is absolutely a costume, right? Timeless style is impossible. Now, OK, so then you think, well, we'll go the other direction. Does that mean that I have to follow all the trends? Because a lot of people do think that, that in order to actually be stylish, you have to be fashionable, and that means you have to follow the trends. But trends are kind of a danger too, right? This was killing it back in the 90s, and now we can look at that and go, oh dear. <laughs> and all the stuff that we're wearing today, especially the more aggressive you get, in 20 years, we're gonna look back and go, oh boy, what was I thinking with that? And the problem is, is that we use the fear of this to convince us that this is the alternative. And again, it's, it's another false dichotomy. It's not either or. The way that it works is it's one big cycle. Because, OK, take that to its logical extreme. If, if good style is timeless, then what that means is that I could dress up as George Washington or Socrates or somebody because they looked great in their time period. And so if, I mean, if this is good when men were men, then men were really men back then. And so I should dress like that. And again, we can see how comical that is when we get a little bit further away from the time period. Nobody's going to show up in a toga and think, I'm bringing masculinity back, right? <laughs> of course not. But we think it when it comes to suiting and stuff because we're just one step removed from that. One of the hard things about good style is, yes, it actually moves and changes. You can't avoid that. You can't accomplish timeless style. When it comes to things like suiting or stuff that may be a little bit more conservative or more dignified, that change happens more slowly, and you're welcome to embrace that. Or if you're somebody who wants to embrace the fast pace of change with trendiness, you can do that too, and you just have to embrace the fact that that means in five years or 10 years, you're going to look back and go, that was stupid. Glad I tried it, but that was stupid. You know, it worked then or something else. But you can't avoid, you can't avoid the risk of regret when it comes to dressing well. You can't. And even if you go through and you look at, uh, my wife and I just finished watching um, The People vs. O.J. Simpson, the one that was on, uh, it's on Netflix, and it's got, uh, it was good. And 
it's really interesting to see what the dream team, you know, this, this whole awesome team of the big powerhouse lawyers were wearing for their suits in 1995. And they're awful. They really are. You know, they're, they're bad. They're just, you know, and I'm wearing a double-breasted suit today, but even then, they're cut differently. It's these massive shoulder pads, and they're super baggy and all. But at that point, they, they weren't even trendy. They were just dignified and, and acceptable, and they were with the times. And so, again, you can't, you can't play it easy and convince yourself that either I have to be trendy or that good style is timeless. You have to know where you want to be in that current. Is it worth it to you to be in the fast part of the stream and play the trend? For some of you guys, it is. Or is it worth it for you to be in maybe one of the eddies where things rotate a little bit more slowly, but either way, you're in the current. You're not in a lake. It's not going to stop. It's not going to stand still. You need to be willing to change as the change happens. This is one that I, um, I was recently introduced to me, actually. I, uh, most of the style community doesn't like me very much. Um, that's not true. I have a lot of guys within the style world who like me, but a lot of guys don't. They don't like it because I talk about how it's related to masculinity, and it really bugs them that I talk about stuff like dressing in a way that's powerful or trying to express that you have self-respect and dignity. And, they, and from their perspective, they just think, well, I just, I just want to look good. I just like style because I look good. And in the past, I've kind of argued against that. And I've started to come around to the fact that there's actually something to this idea. And we as men, especially those that are still kind of stuck in the phase of, you know, I don't care how I look as long as my clothes are functional, we think that that's all that matters, that my physical comfort or my ability to apparently put a bunch of stuff in my side pockets. And I, I really, I don't have a, a thing against cargo pants. I think I'm gonna wear some cargo pants tomorrow, but you can make them look good. Um, but we think that function is kind of the king of everything and aesthetics don't matter. And so again, let's take that out of the realm of clothing and apply that into other scenarios in our lives, okay? Think about your architecture. Think about the buildings that we're in, right? I mean, all it really has to do is protect you from the weather. But we appreciate beauty for its own sake when it comes to architecture, don't we? I know I love being in beautiful buildings and seeing pretty skylines and things like that. What about the food we eat? Well, if I get the right macro ratio and I've got my calories, then it doesn't matter how it tastes. It matters. We absolutely care about our experience when we're eating food. And good food and the taste of good food is beautiful in and of itself, irrespective of what it does for us based on calories or macronutrients or anything else. We enjoy it not because of the function, but because of the experience of participating in it. It's the same thing with music or with sociality or anything else. And again, think about, think about your relationship with women. You don't see a beautiful woman and go, yeah, you know what? Biologically, I think she'd be a good fit. I mean, that's, those, are, those are really good calves, and I, you know, I like those hips. I think those would be really good for bringing me a couple kids. In the, no, of course not. You appreciate beauty for its own sake, right? Same thing with when you're traveling. Right? People don't go to the beach because it's functional, we go to the beach because we appreciate beauty for its own sake. And this is one of the things, I love that Goldman talks about this. As men, we can embrace beauty for its own sake. Now, I'm not saying you need to dress in a way that's beautiful, but I am saying that you can embrace aesthetics within your style. You can embrace looking handsome. You can embrace looking good, not simply because it serves a function or because it's how I communicate status within my tribe or because this is how I'm gonna be able to be the most comfortable in this environment. Those are good things. But a lot of times you can make a decision simply because I think it looks good. And as long as it's not conflicting with all those other things, then that's a really good rubric by which you can make a good decision about the way that you dress. What I don't want you guys to do, and this is one of the things that I'm working with a lot of my own clients on, is getting so set on the fact that it's, okay, well, does this fit with my archetypes? And what is my tribe gonna think? And how am I signaling this there to that? All of that stuff does matter. But sometimes what it comes down to is, do I like the dark wash on the jean or do I like the light wash? And you can, you can make a decision based on that. Anybody who tells you otherwise, that you're effeminate or that you're gay or that you're weird because you make decisions based on that stuff, again, they're telling themselves their own pretty lies and it's based in some weird aversion that they have for either social risk or miscommunicating how they are as a man and that has nothing to do with you. So it does not have to be based on function in order to be valuable to us as men. Okay. Um, 
Here's another good one. Good style has to draw attention. This is one of those where I see a lot of guys as they're kind of new and getting started in the game. Uh, they think that in order to be able to dress well, they, you know, I know we don't, I don't hear this term very often anymore, but it's like, I have to peacock. You know, I have to be able to, I have to, I have to stand out, I have to draw attention. And I, I get that because again, you know, when you are able to recognize that you're not just playing not to lose, you're not just trying to fit in and to blend in, that, well, obviously the opposite of that is that I have to stand out, but again, another false dichotomy. You don't have to just stand out for the sake of standing out, and especially in, uh, in the ways that a lot of guys really think that they need to stand out. We already talked about the formality one, but another thing guys really get into are things like color and pattern. They, they think, okay, well, cool. I don't want to just wear a navy suit with a white shirt like everybody else in my office. So the way that I'm going to stand out because I care more about styles, I'm going to wear a purple suit with a green shirt because that's how you stand out. And it's like, well, yeah, you're going to stand out, but that's a negative standout, especially if you work in a serious environment. But we do that. We convince ourselves that in order to be better, we need to be so visibly different that it really changes things. And good style, it can be done that way. Absolutely, pattern and color and these kind of big bombastic changes to your appearance, those can be appropriate. But a lot of times, good style, uh, if you guys, again, on Twitter, if you follow uh, at Wellbuilt Style, Manny, his, his saying is uh, simple style is winning style. So you can look at stuff like this, very simple, right? I mean, you've got a chambray shirt with some chinos and some boots, a sweater with another pair of chinos, a t-shirt, some, I don't know if those are jeans or flannel trousers and like a little uh, knit bomber, super simple stuff. Not too formal, not too casual, but the fit's great, right? The colors are simple. You see any crazy patterns or any wild colors on there? No, right? Are we seeing any like fun socks or anything like that? No, it's really simple. But what makes it good is that the fit is great. They've got some good textures going on. They're wearing it confidently. Yes, again, that confidence matters and they're wearing it within the right context. And so you do not have to stand out in this crazy attention-seeking way in order to be dressed well. In fact, more often than not, that's actually a liability and it's not gonna do you as much good. A lot of the guys that I get in through my program are guys who work in the IT industry. And they are constantly debating with this problem of, okay, well, everybody, everybody that I work with wears a t-shirt and jeans and sneakers, and I wanna have good style. I don't wanna look like the rest of these guys. And so they'll spend time before they find me, and it's like, okay, well, I'm gonna try the suit. Okay, that didn't work. All right, I'm gonna try a polo, but that doesn't look any better. Well, what do I do? And nine times out of 10, the right answer is, you still wear a t-shirt, jeans, and sneakers. We just get them so that they fit you better, and they're higher quality material, and that the sneakers are kind of classic and they're a little bit more visually interesting than a pair of Sauconies that you pick up at Payless for 14 bucks. And all of a sudden, you can be appropriate within the context of that work environment, but you can look infinitely better. And guys aren't gonna see you as standing out in a way where it's like, he doesn't, he doesn't fit in anymore. He, he thinks he's better than the rest of us. But you will stand out in a subtle way. You will be somebody who is recognized as being better dressed, as someone who takes himself more seriously, as somebody who has more authority, more credibility, someone who is actually doing more, has more discipline within his life. Again, the appropriateness, the formality of it is exactly the same. You're not standing out based on those big things like color or formality or pattern. The only way that you're standing out is based on the simple stuff. It's based on those little things. All right, let's jump into this one. Attracting women is the only reason we should care about style. I get this one a lot too. Most of the time it's from men who they let their wives uh, do the shopping for them or their girlfriends or sadly their moms. And yeah, and they think, well, all that matters is that, you know, that girls think that my style is good. You know, well, if it works when I'm out picking up chicks, then it's great. And I'll tell you guys that when it comes to this kind of stuff, the opinion of women really doesn't matter that much. Controversy. It really doesn't matter that much. Because you can be well-dressed in so many different contexts. And what you're doing when you're dressing well is you're signaling things that ultimately are much more important within the men in your life, and then they are confirmed and ratified by the women within your life. So let's talk about that a little bit. Think about when you're in 
uh, okay, we'll go back to a work environment. Think about when you're in a work environment and you're dressing in a way that is indicative of the fact that you, you're trying to go somewhere. You're not at the bottom of the barrel. You're not overstepping your bounds and dressing like the guys who are kind of on the top rung, but, but you're trying to look like you're, you're trying to go someplace. You're signaling status, right? And status is not something that is granted to us by the women in our lives. It's not. I know a lot of guys, especially in the pickup community or other things, will tell us that, well, you're only a real man if you have so many notches under your belt, right? Or you're only a real man if women respond to you a certain way. But ultimately, it's putting the cart before the horse because women respond positively to men who have high status. They don't give high status to men on their own, if that makes sense. I know that that can be kind of a subtle distinction, but it's an important one. Because the people who grant you status in your life are typically the men who are setting the rules by which you play, whether that's in a work environment or it's a hobby that you engage in or it's you know, your friends or when you were a kid it was the, the people that you had in school or whatever else it may be. It may be something as big as an industry. The majority of the time, the people who are setting those status rules and that are helping you understand how to navigate that whole social hierarchy, it's usually men. And then when you've attained a certain level of status, then you get the added bonus of being attracted to women who fit within that group, that, that culture, that tribe, and then they help bump your status even higher because now the other men can see, well, that, that worked because not only does he already have high status, but he's attracted to women, so double whammy. But again, you can't come in to something and think that, well, all I need to do is be attractive to women and therefore my status will increase. You're, again, you're putting the cart before the horse. And so to think about it in this context, if you're dressing to attract women, it's, it's not gonna work for you. I mean, I guess it could, but then you're missing opportunities as, as far as all these other things that you can do. As far as how you can leverage that relationship that you have with other men, or how you can leverage that relationship, your own self-perception. And I do, I see this a lot with other guys who come onto the site or things like that, where they will, they will create this entire wardrobe and it's all based on what they think this one particular girl or this group of girls are gonna like. And then they go through putting it together and putting it on, and usually they don't execute on it very well, but nine times out of 10, what, they, what really ends up happening is, they, I just feel like a poser. I just, I don't feel like myself when I wear this. And so their confidence goes down, and really what they usually end up signaling is that, well, they, they are a poser because you're not actually, you haven't actually earned the right to wear high status clothes like that. I'll give you an example from my own personal life. Um, I have a brother who's a professional snowboarder, was for a few years. And at the time when he was really on top of his game, and sports are weird, especially the way that guys do clothes and sports and stuff like that. At this one particular time, all the big snowboarders were wearing really baggy pants and they would wear basketball jerseys and then they would have a certain type of like brim beanie and you'd have these big massive goggles. And that was what all the pros looked like, okay? So again, if we were just dressing in a way that we were trying to attract women, if that was the main goal, then that means that I show up on the mountain and I'm dressed like all these guys because the women are attracted to these guys and obviously are attracted to these guys because they dress that way, right? And so then I show up on the mountain and I can't do anything on a snowboard because I don't actually have any skill in that arena whatsoever. And then what happens? You look like an idiot. You aren't attracting anybody because you're sitting here projecting this big game of I have, I have, demo, I have attained a level of mastery within this and I am high status within this tribe and I'm really good at this sport and I'm in with all these guys. But then your actual skill set, what you're actually delivering is completely antithetical to that. It's the opposite. And so what you're wearing is proving you a liar, right? Whereas you're much better off if you're kind of the beginner on there and you're trying to attract those girls. One, maybe that's not the best place to go look for girls because they're going to be interested in those guys and maybe you're better off looking for girls in a place where you're really good. Or if you like those kind of girls and you want to get good at it, then you get good at it and you continue to get better at it and then you improve your style as you become more and more part of that particular group or that particular tribe until you've actually earned the right through mastery, through status, through becoming part of that group to actually dress like you belong. You know, I think about, uh, you guys remember Back to the Future 3, when Marty McFly gets all of his cowboy gear and he just looks like an idiot because it's all prim and proper. That's what so many of us do when we're trying to dress in a way that the only thing that matters is attracting women. We end up just kind of shooting ourselves in, in the foot on that. That's the problem that we create. 
Okay, um, sorry, I'm gonna go back. Well, we can just leave that there. There's one more thing that I hadn't prepared that I wanna talk to you guys about uh, as far as another lie. This is one that has come up within the last little while. And it's the idea that good style means, you know, wherever you are now, in order to improve your style, you have to have a really big transformation, okay? And I get that. I love the idea of transformations. I mean, you see fitness transformations, especially on Instagram or stuff like that. And we all love seeing the guy who goes from, you know, 300 pounds and he's 99.9% .9 body fat to he's now, well, you know, a, a great lean 175 and he's 0.1% body. We love that kind of stuff, right? Because it's demonstrative of things like dedication and hard work and all this, this kind of stuff. It's great, okay? And you see attempts to do that within the communities uh, that is centered around things like appearance and style especially from stylists and more often than not from, from female stylists, where what they will do is they will take, you know, I mean, talk about, uh, actually, I've never seen an episode, but I've seen some of their before and afters, but like Queer Eye for the Straight Guy on, uh, on Netflix and that kind of stuff, where they'll take these kind of bumbling idiots in their cargo shorts and their World of Warcraft t-shirts, and then by the end of it, they're wearing suits and, and this kind of stuff, and it's like, wow, look at this great transformation. But what they never show you is that six months later, this dude is back in his cargo shorts and his t-shirts. Because again, this is just a costume, right? There's no actual authenticity to it. There's no expression of who he is internally. All he's doing is just being a mannequin for his stylist. That's, that's the only thing that he's done at that point. That's why it's so crucial for you guys to learn how to do this for yourselves. Because good style is not this crazy major transformation. Some of you guys are hearing t-shirts and you're wearing, you know, like hypey sneakers. I saw a couple guys wearing some good NMDs and stuff like that. Putting you guys in suits is not going to work. Other of you guys are here and you're wearing suits and so putting you in the latest streetwear stuff is not going to work either, right? The real way to do it is that you take what you have, you get rid of the stuff that you're not good at, and you double down on the stuff that you are good at. So that it's not this big 180 degree turn, it's just an evolution. It's becoming a better version of what you are. It's cutting out all the dead weight and being able to actually express, again, externally who you are internally. Because that's the biggest secret to all of this. That's the biggest thing that most guys, when they start to realize I need to dress better, don't quite understand. Is that it has to be both internal and external. If there's not congruence there between the two of them, it's not going to last. It's not going to stick and you're going to hate it. You're not going to get the benefits of the competence, the context, and the confidence because you're going to miss one of those. Either you're going to look awful, but you're going to feel confident because it's what you're used to, which again is where most men are. I hate it. I don't really like the way that I look, but I'm comfortable in it. It's what I'm used to, so I'm going to stick with it. Why mess with it if it ain't broke? Or I'm going to work with a stylist. I'm going to go through a transformation, and yeah, I look good, but this is stupid, and I don't like the way I feel at all. Once again, false dichotomy. Those are not the only options that you guys have. So what I want you to be able to do as you go through all of this is recognize that what you need to really have a good grasp on how you present yourself to the world is you need to know who you are internally. And you need to know who you're becoming and then you need to be able to express that externally. That's one of the questions that I get a lot, especially from guys like you at events like this is, okay, what if I'm like, 75% cool with who I am right now, but I know I want to be better. Do I fake it until I make it? Or how do I, how do I make that work? And that's, that's a valid question. I actually genuinely love that question. Because the correct answer is yes, you do kind of both, right? And you think about it within the principles of, uh, of like weight training, okay? You think about progressive overload. I talk about this in the book. Um, if, I, if I wanted to go and deadlift 500 pounds, I'm not going to go to the gym today and put on 500 pounds. I can't. And I think the last time I did a one rep max on a deadlift, I was at 315. So if I were to go and put that on, that's, that's good. But if that's all I stuck with, that's me being authentic. That's me focusing on dressing to who I am right now. Then I would never actually get from 315 to 500. But what I do is I go in and I put a little bit more weight on. And then I put a little bit more weight on. And then I put a little bit more weight on as I go. You can do the same thing with your appearance and with your style. Dress authentically to who you are, but then dress aspirationally to who you want to be. 
So whether that's within the context of a work environment, if you're down at the bottom and you want to work at the top, don't dress like the guy at the top, dress like the guy who's one step above you. And then when you get to that level, then you dress like that guy and you continue on and on and on. It's that progressive overload within that whole system. Same thing within any group that you're trying to dress, that you're trying to become part of or trying to increase your status within. Same thing with just your own self-perception. That's another one of the questions that I get a lot from guys um, as they are going through a weight loss. You know, okay, so should I be, what should I be doing as far as my style right now? Because I've got 25 or 40 more pounds to drop. Should I be spending any money on clothes or anything right now? The right answer is yes. You buy cheap stuff and use this as a perfect opportunity to experiment, to go through that progressive overload, to be able to look at it and go, well, I'm, I'm gonna get rid of these clothes anyway, so maybe I take a little bit more social risk, or maybe I do dress in a way that's a little bit more aspirational, because if it doesn't work, so what? I know I'm not gonna be wearing those same clothes in a month anyway, so then I can correct and I can go to the next thing. So you can use those as opportunities to be able to be both authentic and, is, and aspirational in what it is that you're trying to build. So take that last one, the idea that style doesn't have to be this big transformation. It's progressive overload. It's a gradual progression of who you are and what you're trying to do. Um, real quick, before I open it up to questions, I just, again, I wanna tell you guys how awesome you're doing. Um, I, I Seriously, your, your shoe game, just your intentionality. It's been so fun, you know, again, three years and just see how much you guys have progressed. Um, if you're interested in talking more about this stuff with me, I'm going to be here and I would love to talk more. As we answer questions, uh, some, it might just be, if you get really specific, then the, the answer will probably be, it depends. Because again, that context thing is, is huge. And so I'll answer those for you. But if you guys are interested in learning more even about how I can help you out specifically coaching, I've got a couple of my clients like Jack and Phil and other guys who are here that they're happy to talk to you about how that program has gone for them. So. Thank you guys for your time. I'm excited to answer questions and talk to you guys throughout, and hopefully I can help you guys level up even another level on how you guys are looking. So thank you. Hey, Tanner. Um, awesome talk, as always. Thank you. Very informative. Um, I was wondering, what's your system on gauging what kind of context you're going to be in. So like, for example, um, you're having a dinner party somewhere or you're having uh, different events where you don't really know the people. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of um, unknowns. So how, how do you go um, with selecting your style to be appropriate? Good question. Okay, so the first thing that I, that I do is you try and understand as much as you can about the environment. So if you're going to a dinner party or something like that, where is it going to be? Who are the people that are gonna be there? And it's very rare that you actually go into a complete unknown. So the better you can understand all of those kinds of variables, especially things like formality or where in the world it is, so how hot or how cold it's gonna be or stuff like that, then you can gauge that. If it is a complete unknown, then usually what I try and do, especially on that formality spectrum, is you just kind of split the difference and you're kind of right there at a five or a six. And so for me, that may be a button up shirt with some chinos and a sport coat. So then that way, if I need to dress it up, then that's appropriately dressed up enough. Or if that's too overdressed, then you can ditch the jacket and you're still kind of appropriately casual enough. So you're just kind of splitting the difference with that. But more often than not, you can do enough homework to be able to get the context and then you just go from there, so. Hey Tanner, do you have any uh, brands or vendors that you'd recommend for finding better quality clothing? That depends. <laughs> what do you mean by better, right? So that's, that's where it gets hard because there are plenty of brands that are out there, but are you looking for stuff that's more like classic Americana stuff? Are you looking for stuff that's more streetwear? Are we looking at suiting or those kind of things? So um, come talk to me after and I can get a little bit more context as far as what you're looking after. And then I'm happy to point you in the direction of some good brands that will actually be beneficial for you. Yeah. Hey Tanner, uh, great speech. Thank you. Um, my question is, um, so you mentioned how it's kind of a skill skit when you're learning how to dress better, right? So my question is, um, for the winter time, uh, is it also a skill set learning how to layer clothing during winter? Because, you know, you have so many garments, you have like the the base layer of you know, maybe it's a t-shirt and then you have like the sweater over, you know, how do you go about that? Is it like, a, is it a separate skill set in itself or is it just uh, a matter of learning how to experiment with different types of uh, winter clothing and whatnot? Uh, yes, it's both. 
and that's what's fun. Um, winter time and being able to, uh, to experiment with layers and that kind of stuff really is a lot of fun. Um, I'll give you some basic rules of thumb that are appropriate for that. The first one is that you typically want, uh, as you get further in and closer to your body, you want those to be layers that are lighter in color. So for example, if you were doing suiting, um, you would never want your tie to be darker than your shirt. Or for the most part, you want kind of your layers as you go further out away from your body into a sweater or a top coat or something else like that to be darker. Um, other good rules are if you're playing around with different layers, you don't want anything to look like it's trying to match and missing. So if you're playing with different patterns, you want there to be enough disparity between them that, you know, it's not like this is a, my, my jacket is a small check and my sweater is a less small check. And so maybe one is like a big check and another is a small stripe or something else so that you don't look like you're trying to match a bunch of different things and actually missing. You want some intentional contrast with it, but ultimately, that's again where it can come down to, you know, are you playing with textures? Are you playing with weights? Are you playing with different materials? Because cashmere looks different than wool, which looks different than cotton, and all of those can be appropriate, even if they're all similar in color or they're all solid without any pattern or anything else, and you can play with things that way. So it's just playing with those dials the way that you can. Yeah. Uh, really concise, Tanner. Um, what constitutes the incorporation of one of the newest accessories, the man bag? <laughs> You're talking about like the 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 uh, Gucci fanny pack. Yeah, wearing I, I over see their the shoulders gentleman there, now, right? In, the, in your photo, I'm assuming that maybe yeah. uh, like a, a yeah, a, this little thing right here. Yeah, it's tribal. It just depends on where you are. Yeah, that's where context can really come in because. You know, if you are in an urban environment and you're somebody who leans a little bit more towards uh, a style that's a little bit more refined, then that's actually something that can be appropriate. And it may be just a slim messenger bag or something that's a briefcase, or it may be something that actually is a little bit more purse-like. If you're working out on an oil rig in North Dakota, you better stay far away from that stuff. Right. right. <laughs> so it, it's really, it's very contextual. And that's one of the things that's really important to understand with style is that I mean, George Washington wore tights, right? We look at that kind of stuff today and we go, there's no way I'm touching that. But everything is totally, con I mean, the Native Americans that I showed you guys, they're wearing makeup, dude. I've got makeup on right now. George put it on me. It's weird. But I'm not doing it to try and look pretty for you guys. It's just to avoid any flaws or anything else like that because of what the camera's going to pick up. So context and what you're trying to accomplish is way more important than being able to draw a hard line in the sand as far as yes, you can do this, or no, you can't do that, because it depends. All right, thank yeah. you. Uh, I'm currently wearing 10 and a half quadruple E's. What advice do you have for wide feet? And I, I've driven four hours one way just to buy shoes, because it's a nightmare sometimes. Um, how, many, how many shoes do you rotate through as far as, uh, like, throughout a week? I don't know, three or four. I only have really one pair of dress shoes that I wear at work, though, so... Gotcha. Uh, I would say in a situation like yours, especially because foot size is not something that really changes, um, it's worthwhile to invest. Whether that's going through a maker, I'm not sure if Allen Edmonds, I know they do triple E, I'm not sure if they go all the way up to quadruple E, but maybe even doing a fully custom pair. Because again, it's not like you're gonna grow out of them. And in a lot of cases, something like that is gonna be a long-term investment anyway. You know, a pair of shoes like these, um, once the sole runs out, then I can get them resold. These shoes, as far as the upper and the leather and everything else, they'll basically last forever. And so in a situation like yours, you can even look at it as, you know, the amount of time that you took trying to find the right pair and having to repeat that process over and over again, what's that worth versus investing in something that you know is gonna fit great, it's gonna look great, it's gonna last forever. And so it sounds like custom may actually be a better route for you. Thanks. Yeah. Hi, Tana. Thanks for a great talk. Um, what do you do? Uh, I travel full time. So mm -hmm. how do you do style in like a limited space? So you've only got a suitcase. What kind of things do you need? How do you start with that? Basically? Good question. That's a fun one. Um, this comes down to versatility and being able to have a bunch of things that you can kind of mix and match and make them work together really well. One of the best ways to do that is to avoid a bunch of color, avoid a bunch of pattern, and just focus on, again, kind of texture, and you want stuff to not be too formal, nor do you want stuff to be too casual. So, for example, jeans that can look great on their own, or they can look really good with a sport coat, and then it's actually a sport coat as opposed to a suit jacket, or that kind of stuff. And so, even, I'll give you some kind of, some color advice that's helpful with it. And honestly, most of my wardrobe consists of just these colors on their own anyway. Um, 
blues, browns, grays, and whites. You avoid everything else. And then, because the problem that you run into is it's just like, okay, well, there's that, there's that green shirt again because it's more memorable because it's a color that's not as versatile. It's great, you know, the color's fine, but the more memorable, memorable it is, the less often you can repeat it mm -hmm. because then people recognize that you're, you're recycling the same shirt. Whereas if it were a simple white button down or a blue something, then you can, you can get away with wearing it three times in a week as long as it doesn't smell bad and nobody else is going to even notice. Cool. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I like your double breasted suit. Thank you. I'd like to know if that's going to be coming back in fashion. Oh, yeah. I mean, I already brought it back, right? No. I can't, I can't, <laughs> I can't find them anywhere. That's why I like I want to get back to it. And my second question is, what about the French cut double breasted? Um, is that in something I can incorporate into my uh, outfits? So, again, depends on the context, okay? Because... If you are part of the kind of sartorial world, like the guys who really geek out about menswear and that kind of stuff, then there's room for you, especially with double-breasted or wide lapels. I mean, I'm wearing, I'm wearing pleats on a lot of my stuff again because that's kind of where that, that particular tribe is going in relationship to its clothing. So for you, whether or not you can incorporate that, it just depends on is a look that's that strong is that going to be to your advantage in the relationships that you have with the people around you, or is that going to be an increased liability for you? And so as soon as you can navigate where that is, then you can make the assessment. It's like, yeah, that's worth the risk, or no, I'm going to wait, or I'm only going to wear it when I'm within a certain context. And so it kind of depends. Well, I would like to know, because that was a style used back in the 40s and uh -huh. 50s a lot. Would I be out of, like you say, out of time with that wearing those kind of outfits? Mm -hmm. You know, it's like the kid you put up with a top hat. I don't right. want to be looking like that, right. you know, wearing a, a double-breasted French cut. Yeah, and that's, again, where it's difficult because I would say if you're trying to resurrect old suits that you had from that time, you can't do it because the double-breasted that I have on now is different from one that's in 1995, which is different from one that's exactly. in 1945. And so that's where it does start to turn into that kind of gentleman cosplay stuff where you're trying to resurrect a vintage style as opposed to taking those cues and injecting them into a contemporary context. And so I would say take whatever it is that you like about that and find a, a new or a more appropriate way to get that same thing out of it as opposed to just trying to recreate it exactly the way that it used to be. Okay, thank you. Yeah. All right, guys. Anybody else? Okay, we got one more coming up. Uh, thank you. Uh, great stuff. Uh, I earlier learned that when you use stripes, and if you are short height like me, or uh, then you shouldn't do the horizontal stripes. Right. And you should do the horizontal stripes only if you are very tall. Uh, is that still stay? Yeah. Is that is is that kind of still the rule? Yeah. Yeah. So that's that's one of the few things that actually falls within. And I know it's really easy to fall into the temptation of I want to know the rules. You know, what is something that's kind of timeless and it's permanent? And that is one of them. But there are a few things about style that actually kind of go across the board. Uh, color theory, things like um, do you have a warm or a cool complexion? What colors are going to make your skin look healthy? That's one of them. And then patterns and the way that those work. Yes. When you're shorter, well, really, where, however you're built, if you wear a vertical stripe, visually what that does is it kind of elongates and thins you out. And so if you're a bigger guy and you want to look thinner, or if you're a shorter guy and you want to look taller, vertical stripes are awesome. Whereas if you're a skinny guy and you want to look a little bit broader than wearing a plaid or like a box and a check or even a horizontal stripe is going to be better. If you're a wide guy and you, you don't want to look bigger than you already are, you're, you're going to want to avoid a horizontal stripe. So that is kind of timeless just because of visually what happens. But again, you need to think about that within the context of something because context and communication are always going to supersede those simple rules of style. For example, you can talk about things like contrast where somebody like Tex, who's got really light hair and a light complexion, he's better off if he's wearing lighter colors. But if he's going to an event that is a black tie event in a tuxedo, he's gonna look stupid if he shows up in a powder blue tux as opposed to a black one, irrespective of what actually looks good based on his coloring and everything else because the communication and the context are gonna supersede that. So if you're in an environment where, you know, maybe you're on a, I don't know, a rugby team and you have to wear a horizontal striped shirt, wear it as opposed to it's like, no, I'm skinnier. I need a vertical stripe one because that, lo that looks better on me. So yeah, the context is always going to supersede those rules. Thank you. Yeah. 
Uh, thank you for your talk. I, I enjoyed the one last year as well. It really helped me thank uh, you. get on my game. But um, uh, I was just having some debates about with some guys about like simple solutions. And so I wanted to know your opinion on like the statement, like the gym is the best tailor, right? Like getting your body fit is the, is really good that you can do for your style. Yep. Yep. I would agree with that. Um, you have so much more leeway in what you can get away with when you're in good shape. And sadly enough, when you're handsome, you know, if you've got good facial structure, or if your grooming is on point or anything else, you have so much more leeway as far as what you can get away with. But what I would say is a lot of guys use that as a crutch. They think that I don't have to dress better because I go to the gym and I work out. And really what you're doing is you're kind of cutting yourself off at the knees because then you become, and a lot of guys who are in great shape, they really are kind of one dimensional where they either dress in a way where they look like they just came back from the gym because it's like, you know, I go to the gym, right? Like you can, you can tell, it's like, dude, we know you go to the gym. There's, there's more to you than that, right? Or they use it as the excuse of, oh, I'm just so big, I can't find anything. Yeah, you can, you can find stuff that fits. You just have to put in a little bit more energy to it. So a lot of, yes, absolutely, you will look better in anything if you're in good shape and you will look even better if you still put energy into your style and your appearance while you're in good shape. So, so it's like you said, the confidence isn't, you have to have all. Exactly. All it's a balance between all yep. three things. All of okay. it. Yep. Thank you. Yep. Uh, I noticed you're wearing what looks like to be a smartwatch. Yes. And, uh, Blasphemy, right? <laughs> <laughs> I've, uh, I've heard that Apple and some of these companies are starting to hire uh, executives from places like Louis Vuitton, mm -hmm. and they're starting to think a lot about style. How do you see um, technology and technology pieces tying into style and how that projects what you're looking to accomplish? That's a fun question. I like that. Um, I guess it just depends on how anything is going to go anyway. You know, thankfully the Google Glass never took off, right? <laughs> Glad we're not all wearing those. Um, so it will be interesting to see as, as smart technology evolves, but brands like Apple and others, they recognize, I mean, Apple, they're, they're known for their attention to detail when it comes to aesthetics, right? When it comes to the way that their, their machines are created or even I had a buddy who used to work for them, and I'm pretty sure that he said that each one of the cords under the tables in the, in the store had to have like 13 coils, like they're super hyper uh, sensitive to detail about stuff like that. So I'm not surprised at all that even like the new, the latest edition, it's longer and a little bit broader so that it fits over the wrist a little bit better and it's more aesthetically pleasing. And so, yeah, I think that we'll continue to see more and more of that being a focus so that it's not this piece of technology that's kind of on you, but it's something that's more integrated within you and within your appearance. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Tanner, thank you very much. Thanks, Let's guys. give it up for Tanner Guzzi.